All friendships are over. Those are the words of a Lithuanian citizen named Darius when asked about what was happening between his country and the Russian exclave of Kaliningrad. His comments come in the wake of what LRT, or Lithuanian National Radio and Television, calls more symbols of separation between the Baltic state and its Russian-owned neighbor, with Darius going on to say that he had Russian friends when he was a child. Those friends even came to visit him in the Panamuna region, which is just across a bridge from Kaliningrad. Those friends aren't visiting anymore. And neither does Darius have any intention of crossing the bridge into Kaliningrad. The reason? Russian President Vladimir Putin's acts of aggression in Ukraine threaten not only the sovereignty of Ukraine, but also carry threats that Russia may attempt to take Lithuania if it's successful in its current war. As for the symbols of separation, they're actually far from mere symbols. They're preparations for war that many in Lithuania believe is coming. A war with Kaliningrad. But why is Lithuania gearing up to fight against the Russian exclave? What does all of this have to do with the war in Ukraine? And what might happen if Lithuania and Kaliningrad do end up fighting? Those are among the questions we'll answer in today's video. But first, we need to dig deeper into the fortifications that Lithuania has been putting in place to defend itself against Russia. In truth, those fortifications have been cropping up throughout 2024. On February 20th, 2024, just a touch under two years after Russia invaded Ukraine, LRT reported that Lithuania was putting plans in place to fortify its borders with Belarus and Kaliningrad. Their goal was to impede the movements of troops from two nations it now considers its adversaries, with the creation of around 20 counter-mobility parks being high on the agenda. These parks are essentially small patches of land that Lithuania intended to load with a host of defensive equipment, including concertina wire coils, reinforced concrete blocks, and Czech hedgehogs, which are anti-tank obstacles made using metal beams. Lithuania wouldn't be the only country taking these precautions. LRT noted that the other two Baltic states, Latvia and Estonia, had agreed to take similar measures to protect their borders to create what the outlet calls a common defense line against Russia and its Belarusian ally. At the time, Lithuania didn't provide any details about where its counter-mobility parks would be, though the country's deputy defense minister, Zilvinas Tomkus, made special mention of the border with Belarus and what he called the Kaliningrad Strip. Tomkus also revealed that the government planned to spend 1.5% of its defense budget, amounting to nearly $35.5 million, on equipment for its counter-mobility parks in 2024. Fast forward to the end of July 2024, and we saw more examples of Lithuania preparing its border defenses. LRT reported that Lithuania had started to bolster its border defenses not only with the barriers mentioned in February, but also by building trenches and laying down minefields in preparation for a possible invasion from both east and west. Kaliningrad was a particular focus. Lithuania's border with the Russian exclave is already dotted with bunkers built during World War II, which were built by the Soviet Union just months before Nazi Germany invaded Russia. Those bunkers make up a portion of the Molotov Line, which stretches from the Baltic states to the Black Sea, and Lithuania, a former Soviet country, has 300 of those bunkers alone. Granted, the Soviet Union never equipped them with weapons or proper defenses, however, this means that in addition to its counter-mobility parks, Lithuania has a series of ready-made fortifications waiting for it to use. Many of these bunkers now sit disused, owned by whoever happens to own the land on which they sit, and the majority sit in what's called the Sawalki Gap, a 43-mile stretch of land connecting Lithuania to Poland and flanked by Kaliningrad and Belarus. Russia regularly threatens to seize or cut off Lithuania's access to this gap, so the odds are high that the Baltic state is going to look to revitalize these bunkers to reinforce its border defenses against Kaliningrad. All of this brings us back to September 2024 and Darius's comments about Lithuania and Kaliningrad no longer being friends. He made his comments while standing before the Queen Louise Bridge, which stretches over the Nemunas River to link Lithuania and Kaliningrad while looking at the counter-mobility measures Lithuania has installed on it to prevent hostile vehicles from driving from Kaliningrad into the Baltic state. That bridge will eventually become home to seven Czech hedgehogs, along with concertina wire and 80 dragon's teeth, which are pointy pyramid-like obstacles made using concrete and rebar that are laid along a road to prevent tanks from crossing over. More barriers could be built next to the bridge, LRT speculates, with various shoals and fords along the Nemunes River that Russian troops could use to cross into Lithuania having already been identified. The formation of obstacle courses at each of these locations would provide further border defenses, claims the Lithuanian armed forces, with each obstacle slowing Russian troops and making them targets for Lithuanian soldiers. But some other regions near Kaliningrad are also on the Lithuanian agenda. 
The country's chief of defense staff, Major General Remigius Beltranus, says that various parts of Lithuania's border with Kaliningrad run over land, meaning they'll require different defenses than those deployed on the Queen Louise Bridge. There's also the Koronian Spit, a 61-mile sand dune that separates the Baltic Sea from the Koronian Lagoon that needs to be considered. The Koronian Spit is a slightly different water obstacle, says Beltranus when comparing it to the Queen Louise Bridge. It has different access and planning. Beltranus claims that Lithuania's goal is to confront each potential crossing point from Kaliningrad differently based on the terrain, though all with the goal of enabling these installations to come together to form a single defense plan. It all adds up to a massive series of border defenses, costing tens of millions of dollars, that are designed to protect Lithuania from invasion via Kaliningrad. The next question is simple. Why? There are several reasons, with the first having already been touched upon. Putin's threats. Russia's rhetoric around the Suwalki Gap is far from the first threat it's levied against Lithuania, with the Baltic states' ardent support of Ukraine during the war having prompted several more from the Kremlin. For instance, December 2023 saw Belgium's chief of defense, Michael Hoffman, describe both Russia's switch to a war economy in the wake of the Ukraine war and what this might mean for the Baltic states. The language used by the Kremlin and by President Vladimir Putin is always ambiguous. It's possible that they might open a second front at some point in the future, in Moldova or in the Baltic states, he claimed. There are several instances of this type of language throughout the Ukraine war. For instance, April 2022 saw The Guardian report that Putin had warned of the possibility of Russia turning nuclear weapons on the Baltic region if Sweden or Finland join NATO. Putin said that he would send nukes to Kaliningrad if that happened though Lithuanian Defense Minister Arvidas Anusauskas was quick to point out that Russia already had nuclear weapons in Kaliningrad, even though that claim hadn't been independently verified. Sweden and Finland have both joined NATO since these threats were made, and there's been no nuclear follow-through by Putin. Fast forward to February 2024, and Putin was making more nuclear threats, again aimed at the Baltic states, during his annual State of the Nation address. This time, Putin referred to reports that several NATO countries, including Lithuania, were considering putting troops on the ground in Ukraine. All this really threatens a conflict with the use of nuclear weapons and the destruction of civilization. Don't they get that? Putin claimed during the address. As of May 2024, Lithuania remained open to sending its soldiers into Ukraine, if it felt the need. Come September 2024, Putin is again making threats. This time, he's telling Ukraine's Western allies that war may come if they allow Ukraine to use their long-range missiles inside Russia. This will mean that NATO countries, the United States, and European countries are fighting Russia, he claimed in what Politico dubbed a final bid to scare off Western nations from allowing the use of these missiles. While not directed at Lithuania specifically this time, the threats still add to the pile. After all, a Russian war with NATO means a war with Lithuania, given that the Baltic state is a NATO member. There is a clear pattern of intimidation at play here, albeit one that's yet to see Putin follow through on any of his threats. The Russian leader believes that he can use intimidation to corral countries like Lithuania into doing his bidding, or at the very least, force them to stay out of his special military operation. But all he's really succeeded in doing is convincing Lithuania that it's going to be a target of Russian aggression, which is one of the reasons we're now seeing it set up sweeping border defenses near Kaliningrad. Even before building its border defenses, Lithuania was responding to Putin's threats by standing up and becoming one of Ukraine's biggest supporters. In March 2023, the conversation wrote that Lithuania was essentially spearheading both NATO's and the European Union's, or the EU's, efforts to face up to Russia. Frankly, the country has a long history of being brave in the face of adversity, the article argues. It adopted the slogan, Lithuania, a brave country, in 2008, and has lived up to that moniker by directly opposing Russia and Belarus at various points since. In August 2020, Lithuania welcomed Sviatlana Sienovskaya following Belarus's fraudulent presidential elections, essentially protecting her from retaliation by Belarusian dictator Alexander Lukashenko. The country has also been quick to welcome Ukrainian refugees, has provided funds to Ukraine's military, and even seen its Russian-speaking citizens phone Russian people to provide information about what's happening in Ukraine. Lithuania was also one of the first to adopt a resolution calling on the United Nations to establish a no-fly zone over Ukraine following Putin's invasion, and it expelled Russia's ambassador from its capital city of Vilnius in April 2022. Simply put, Lithuania has been a political thorn in Putin's side for a long time. That's why the country takes the threats Putin spews more seriously than many other nations. It believes it understands the lengths of Putin's aggressive ambition, and it aims to protect itself against a potential invasion that may come as much in retaliation for its support of Ukraine as it may due to Putin's spats with NATO and the rest of the West. 
Some might even argue that Putin is already at war with Lithuania. He's just not waging that war in the traditional sense. Shortly after the beginning of the Ukraine war, Putin put his cyber-attacking teams to work to try and destabilize Lithuania's internal mechanisms. One such attack came toward the end of June 2022, albeit with the caveat of the claims by the group that conducted the attack that they weren't connected to Putin's government. That seems hard to believe, though, given the attacks came just days after Lithuania had blocked Russian passage through the country, thus preventing it from reaching Kaliningrad by land. The attacks targeted Lithuanian media and transport websites, as well as sites owned by the country's tax service and similar state institutions. The tax service even had to pause operations for a period, as the attack all but took out its website. The penetrator was a Russian group called Killnet, which claimed on its Telegram channel that the attack was due to Lithuania blocking access to Kaliningrad, not state-sponsored perhaps, but certainly state-influenced, with Killnet clearly acting in the best interests of the Kremlin, even if it claims no associations. The Ukraine war has been marked by similar attacks ever since. Fast forward to February 3rd, 2024, and a pro-Russian hacking group was at it again. This time, the target was Ilyas, which is the Lithuanian Armed Forces Distance Learning System. The hackers, this time operating under the name Just Evil, claimed to have hacked not only Lithuania, but the rest of the Baltic states and the US. Lithuania essentially confirmed the hack, noting that it had tracked a suspicious login to Ilyas and, for this reason, three servers of the state telecommunication center hosting the Ilyas training system have been disabled. It appears no data was leaked in this attack. But it's likely no coincidence that the attack came just a couple of weeks before Lithuania announced its plans to shore up its borders with Belarus and Kaliningrad. You also have to wonder why Just Evil would target a Lithuanian army training system. Is it just hitting any target it can find? Or is it trying to get information on how Lithuania trains its armed forces so that Russia and Putin will know what it will be up against when fighting erupts between Lithuania and Kaliningrad? Those questions have yet to be answered, but what is clear is that pro-Russian groups, whether they're directly associated with the Kremlin or not, are carrying out attacks that benefit Putin's ambitions. The Russian president may not have overseen these cyber attacks directly, but it's difficult to see how he wouldn't benefit from them, as they're part of a concerted campaign to destabilize and intimidate Lithuania. Speaking of intimidation, we come to another reason why Lithuania is preparing for war with Kaliningrad. Russia appears to be boosting Kaliningrad's military presence. In late August 2024, several weeks into Ukraine's Kursk invasion, Microsoft Start reported on Russia's continued attempts to control the Baltic Sea and the entire region. Specifically, it noted that Raimundas Vyksnoras, who serves Lithuania as its Minister of National Defense, had claimed to have seen a buildup of military activity in Kaliningrad. Interestingly, these military actions may not be what you expect. Vyksnoras says that Lithuania has noted several troop movements since the beginning of the war starting with soldiers previously stationed in Kaliningrad, being transferred to various areas in Ukraine to wage Putin's war. However, the Minister of National Defense said most of those soldiers returned to Kaliningrad after their Ukraine war rotation. Granted, there had been a significant reduction in these ground forces, likely due to deaths experienced on the Ukrainian front lines, but the fact that they have returned sparks concerns for Lithuania. Even with ground troop reductions, Vyksnoras points out that Lithuania can't become complacent. He claims that the region still contains several A2AD air defense systems, allowing Kaliningrad to control the airspace over the Baltic Sea if needed. There's also the missile problem to consider. CNA, which conducts national security analyses, claims that Russia operates a Baltic fleet of warships that's 52 vessels strong with four of those ships being Sterigushi class corvettes armed with cruise missiles. Many of the ships in this fleet dock in Kaliningrad. The Oblast may also have an extensive collection of land-based missiles, which include anti-ship weapons like the Onyx P-800, with a range of up to 210 nautical miles. Add several dozens of Russia's Iskander nuclear-capable ballistic missiles into the mix, each of which has a range of 300 miles and can easily reach anywhere in Lithuania from Kaliningrad, and you have plenty of reasons for Lithuania to be concerned. Finally, there's the history between Lithuania and Russia to consider. After all, Lithuania was once part of the Soviet Union. After a brief period of independence that began in November 1918 in the aftermath of World War I, Lithuania faced an almost immediate threat from the Soviet army. Russia invaded in January 1919, with the Red Army occupying Vilnius to oversee the installation of a new Soviet government. Lithuania fought back to the point where it had pushed the Soviets out by the midpoint of that year, but the threat was clear. The Soviet Union wanted to own Lithuania. 
The next 20 years saw the Baltic state join the League of Nations and attempt to establish its official borders. Unfortunately for Lithuania, World War II came along in 1939, as did the secret protocols of the German-Soviet Non-Aggression Pact, signed between Germany and the Soviet Union in August 1939. Originally, the pact would have seen Lithuania fall under German control following the war, with Hitler actively courting the country to join in on his attack on Poland. Lithuania instead opted to remain neutral, forcing a revision to the pact that would instead see it fall under Soviet rule if Germany won the war. Lithuania had no idea this pact existed, and it didn't really matter. The Soviet Union made its intentions clear in October 1939 when it forced the Lithuanian government to accept a treaty of mutual assistance, essentially paving the way for Soviet influence to creep into the country. By June 1940, Moscow was demanding that Lithuania install a friendly government while allowing the Soviet Union to admit an unlimited number of troops into the country constitutional violations followed, the Soviet Union managed to take control of staged elections and, on July 21, 1940, Lithuania's newly installed Soviet-approved government was requesting that the country be incorporated into the Soviet Union. Moscow happily accepted its own request to take control of Lithuania. There were hiccups. The peace between Germany and the Soviet Union didn't last, with Germany successfully overrunning Lithuania in mid-1941 not long after Germany launched its attacks against the Soviet Union. The German occupation led to the mass extermination of Lithuania's Jewish community, leading to the country losing 250,000. The Soviets then retook control toward the end of 1944, organizing its own sweeping deportations, with 70,000 Lithuanians being displaced in 1947, followed by another 70,000 in May 1948 and some 80,000 in 1949. It would not be until the fall of the Soviet Union that Lithuania would regain its independence, with the country holding its first post-Soviet elections in 1992. The point here is that Lithuania knows all too well what it means to be an unwilling subject of Russian rule. And given that Putin has indicated that the restoration of the old Russian Empire is one of his key goals, and a large part of the reason for his special military operation in Ukraine, it's no surprise that Lithuania is concerned. Putin would see it as a part of that empire especially given the old Soviet ties, providing yet more reason for Lithuania to be shoring up its defenses against a possible invasion via Kaliningrad. In truth, Lithuania has been trying to separate itself from any aspect of Russian influence for years. We've already seen several examples in this video, including its barring of Russian land access to Kaliningrad and its steadfast support of Ukraine. Both actions are part of a concerted effort to de-Russify the country. April 2023 saw Lithuania pass a series of amendments that tightened the sanctions it had already implemented on Russian and Belarusian citizens in the country. The new bill made it impossible for Russians to apply for citizenship or buy real estate in Lithuania for a year, in addition to suspending applications for temporary residence permits. The measures were extended in 2024 and came amidst Lithuania having received 75,000 Ukrainian refugees since the start of Putin's special military operation. The message is clear. Lithuania doesn't want any Russian influence in its country. That message was reinforced in May 2024 when the country banned Russian and Belarusian observers from monitoring its presidential elections, stating that both countries merely wanted to spearhead campaigns that pose a threat to our national security. The move was a big departure from the convention, as Lithuania is a member of the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, or OCSE, which typically sends teams made up of observers for multiple nations, Russia and Belarus included, to ensure the legitimacy of elections. Lithuania extended an invite to OCSE members, except the aggressor Russia and its supporter Belarus, claiming both were threats to Lithuania's entire political model. Further derussification came in June 2024, when Lithuania extended its Law on the Provision of Information to the Public, which bans the online distribution and retransmission of Russian and Belarusian television and radio programs. Again, Russia's ongoing military campaign in Ukraine was given as the reason, likely with a healthy side helping of Lithuania ensuring the country couldn't do anything to influence its decisions to defend itself from a possible Russian invasion. All of which brings us back to Kaliningrad. Lithuania has a historical precedent that shows why Russia is likely interested in invading its territory and it's taken note of the Russian military buildup in Kaliningrad and the threat it could pose. Now we come to an important question. How do the militaries in Lithuania and Kaliningrad compare? We can determine the strength of Lithuania's military with the help of Global Firepower or GFP which ranks 145 military nations annually. GFP says that Lithuania ranks 88th out of the 145 nations, placing it close to the midpoint of the rankings. 
It only has 23,000 active military personnel, though these numbers are bolstered by the 104,000 reservists who are the result of the country putting mandatory military service in place for all men aged between 18 and 23. It also has a drafting system in place that applies to all men between 18 and 26, meaning that any war with Kaliningrad would likely spark a mobilization that sees Lithuania's active military swell in numbers to the tune of several tens of thousands. The country also has 14,150 people serving in its paramilitary forces, which aren't official parts of Lithuania's military but would likely fight alongside it to repel Russian soldiers from Kaliningrad. The problems for Lithuania come from its lack of equipment. Its air force has only nine assets, almost all of which are fixed-wing transports, with a further four helicopters. Its navy isn't much better, featuring just 11 vessels, including four patrol vessels and four mine warfare ships practically no competition for the powerful Russian Baltic fleet mentioned earlier. Lithuania's land forces fare a little better. Though the country's troops have no access to tanks, they do have 1,356 vehicles, along with 54 units of towed artillery and 21 self-propelled artillery units. Nevertheless, Lithuania is far from a military power, which offers another reason why it's working so hard to secure its border with Kaliningrad. A good early defense will help it to mobilize while slowing Russia's forces down. As for Kaliningrad, it's difficult to get clear numbers. The Hill says that Russia was estimated to be keeping 30,000 soldiers in Kaliningrad before the war, roughly matching what Lithuania has available. But many of these soldiers have been moved around during the special military operation. Several thousand of those troops have also been sent into Kursk to defend against the recent Ukrainian incursion, meaning Kaliningrad may actually have fewer soldiers than Lithuania at the time of writing. Where the Oblast comes out on top is in the equipment race. We've already mentioned the presence of the Baltic fleet and the huge numbers of missiles believed to be stored in Kaliningrad. It's also known that Russia at least sends combat aircraft into the exclave, if not actively storing them there. February 2023 saw a team of Dutch F-35s intercept several of these craft within Polish airspace, with a similar incident occurring in April of the same year that saw UK and German Typhoon fighters intercepting Russian craft over the Baltic region. There are a few definite numbers. Still, it's safe to assume that with its combination of missiles, aircraft, and the Baltic fleet, Kaliningrad would hold advantages over Lithuania both aerially and at sea. As for tanks, the numbers are again uncertain, though the Russian military analysis blog claimed in March 2021 that Kaliningrad has almost 190 tanks, most falling under the command of the 11th Army Corps. So Kaliningrad has the advantage in ground equipment too, though Lithuania's border defenses may make it difficult for Kaliningrad to make that advantage count. The odds are that Kaliningrad would win if it were to face Lithuania alone. The problem for Russia is that alone isn't going to happen. There's one huge factor that could prevent Putin from launching an invasion of Lithuania via Kaliningrad, Lithuania's NATO membership. It, along with the rest of the Baltic states, is protected by Article 5 of the North Atlantic Treaty, which duty binds all of NATO's members to come to the aid of any NATO ally if it's the victim of an armed attack. It's an all-for-one and one-for-all approach that would see all of those other 31 members of the alliance come to Lithuania's aid if Kaliningrad is attacked. Those allies include much of Europe, including military powerhouses like France, Poland, and the United Kingdom. And of course, the US is a NATO member, meaning a Russian invasion of Lithuania via Kaliningrad would be tantamount to Putin declaring war on his greatest foe. After all, the main reason for Ukraine's allies having only provided military funding without sending soldiers is because Ukraine isn't part of NATO. Lithuania is a different prospect for Putin. If he's hell-bent on returning Russia to its empire days, he has to accept that this would mean declaring war on NATO nations, thus incurring the collective wrath of a host of other countries. The final question is simple. Would Putin still send troops from Kaliningrad into Lithuania? The Baltic states certainly believes it's a possibility. There's enough military equipment in Kaliningrad to present serious problems for the Lithuanian military, which is why the country is investing so heavily in its border defenses. Putin has also made plenty of threats about war with NATO during the Ukraine war, suggesting that this is at least a possibility for which Russia's leader is preparing. If nothing else, Lithuania is determined not to be caught unaware. If Kaliningrad invades, Lithuania is going to be ready to fight back. But the war would likely be the first conflict in a much wider war that engulfs the rest of Europe and, possibly, the entire world. But what do you think? Is Lithuania right to be wary of a potential Russian attack via Kaliningrad, or is Putin at least smart enough to know that such an act would essentially be a declaration of war against all of NATO? Share your thoughts about Russia's intentions and Lithuania's preparations in the comments section below, and thank you for watching the video. Now go and check out why Russia will lose Kaliningrad. 
or click this other video instead.